I hope the Sabbath comes to you and you're at peace and, and, and everything is going well with you. Here in North America, things seem to be relatively quiet outside of occasionally the weather. You know, the storm's blowing up the East Coast at this point in time, and I know it's drier than a bone in many places in the American West. But it's not up here. We've been getting tons of rain. Manitoba and Saskatchewan are actually having problems with floods. So it's kind of an interesting year from that standpoint. It's also an interesting year, uh, brethren, if you think about what's going on in the world right now. There's high drama that's going on in the Middle East. Everything that was set up, you know, the way that they arranged the uh, political map of the Middle East a hundred years ago, more or less, at the close of World War I, is all unraveling. You see this group called ISIS, who are these, you know, radical Sunni uh, Muslims, are completely changing the face of what we know as the Middle East. And they're obliterating the borders and it's changing the whole scene. And as you know, you know, at this point in time, perhaps if you've been following the news, there are tens of thousands, millions, in fact, of people who are on the move as refugees. And in these people who are in this area where a couple weeks ago ISIS came down, roaring down from the uh, uh, west of Iraq and the, the, or the east of Syria, they just moved across the border with great strength, capturing Mosul and going all the way down to Tikrit. They're sending just tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people fleeing before them because, you know, the news reports are there that they're going like from door to door and finding people who, you know, they, they consider their enemies and they're killing them and they're fleeing. And many of these people are finding refuge uh, among the Kurds in the northern part of Iraq who are, are actually thinking of breaking away and having their own state. We are in a great state of flux and much is changing. I want you to turn with me. I want to read this particular scripture. Let's go to Obadiah 1. We don't normally go to Obadiah. I don't know how many times in the year I will actually talk about Obadiah. But Obadiah is an interesting book. Obadiah chapter 1. I'm going to read this in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And it, you know, it's talking about here, primarily the focus of the prophet is, is, is he's talking about Edom's sins against Judah, against the Jews. Edom, of course, being the descendants of Esau, who, you know, Esau and Jacob were brothers. But here is talking about how as time had passed, you know, we see a very Middle Eastern thing going on, something that is in some ways being repeated right now over in Iraq. And we'll start here in verse, uh, in chapter 1, verse 10. You will be covered with shame and destroyed forever because of violence done to your brother Jacob. On the day you stood aloof, on the day strangers captured his wealth, while foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were just like one of them. See, on this day, when he is making the point in the kingdom of Judah so long ago, Edom, his brother, you know, he, was, he just said, oh, look at this, they're pillaging, you know, my brother. They're wiping out, you know, my neighbors, and they're, you know, they're captured, you know, they're just just, you know, taking over the land, verse 12, it says, do not gloat over your brother in the day of his calamity. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction. Because they were, obviously. They were doing just like that. Do not boastfully mock in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you... Do not gloat over their misery in the day of their disaster, and do not appropriate their possessions in the day of their disaster. Of course, right now in Iraq, we you see in these places like Mosul and other places, it was, that's exactly what's going on. I think we have to pause here just for a second here while we have a... Okay, are we back on? All right. Verse 14, do not stand at the crossroads to cut off the fugitives and do not hand over their survivors in the day of distress. 
because obviously this is what they were doing. The prophet was warning Edom, don't do that. It's just like right now from this standpoint, you know, actually I am impressed with the Kurds because they're not just keeping, you know, they're not just handing over the fugitives over to ISIS and they're not just turning them away. They've taken a, you know, a lot, tens of thousands at the very least. A lot of people who call themselves Christians and those of others, uh, minorities that aren't in favor with ISIS have found shelter with the Kurds. We have verse 15, For the day of the Lord is near against all nations. As you have done, so it will be done to you. What you deserve will return on your own head. This is a principle. It's a principle that God is, holds nations and people accountable. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 22. We'll take a look at this. God is not a respecter of persons. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 29, I'm going to cite this one in the Amplified Bible version. In Ezekiel 22, 29, it says, The people of the land have used oppression and extortion and have committed robbery. Yes, they have wronged and vexed the poor and needy. See, he's talking here in Ezekiel, he's talking about the people of Israel. He's talking about the people who are God's chosen people, and yet in their own country, in their own place. What are they doing? It says they have wronged and vexed the poor and needy. Yes, they have oppressed the stranger and the temporary resident wrongfully. So all the immigrants that had come in, they were mistreating them, misusing them taking advantage of them. There's a lot of that that goes on these days. Verse 30, And I sought a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land. God is saying here through the prophet Ezekiel that he was looking for somebody. He was looking for an individual, and he's using the symbolism here of standing in the wall, standing in this gap in the wall. You see, walls were a protective device. They were protecting the city. And here the image is that they're protecting the nation. They're protecting the country because they, he's looking for somebody who would make a difference in the treatment of the poor, make a treatment of the, in the, how the, the foreigner who had come in, the refugees and the, the immigrants who were coming, looking for a better life or safety, how these people were being treated. I sought a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Verse 31, Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way I have repaid. He's repaid it by bringing it upon their own heads, says the Lord God. See, God is not a respecter of persons. Didn't matter whether it was Edom that was, you know, looking at their brother at the time when they were, you know, when their enemies came in to to oppress them, and wipe them out. Whether you think about the time of the Assyrians, or the time of the Babylonians, when they had to actually you know, go along with the enemies of the people of Israel, Israel or Judah, and they would you know, say, oh, now's a chance to enrich ourselves. Now's a chance to get even. Now's a chance to grab the land for ourselves. Here he's talking about even in Israel, he, God, during that time, even within among yourselves, he's looking for someone, a man among them, who would build up the wall and stand in the gap. This is something God wants us to do. He's looking, he's wondering, you know, can, you know, and we, we oftentimes wonder, can one person make a difference? Can one person make a difference? Can you make a difference? Can I make a difference? Let's go to 1 John in, in the New Covenant Scriptures in one of the general epistles of the Apostle John. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. That's 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. I'm going to stay with the Amplified here for a moment. By this we come to know, and as the Amplified puts out, you know, that know what it's the Greek here is indicating progressively to recognize. By this we're coming to progressively recognize, to perceive, to understand. By this we come to know the essential love, the love of God, that he laid down his own life for us, 
And we ought to lay down our lives for those who are our brothers in him. See, this is how we come to understand, as we begin to progressively understand, truly God's essential love for humanity is that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And he's saying, well, we, you know, we should follow his example. See, this is a principle that's gone on for, for a long time. God's people have understood, whether we're talking about the original church in Jerusalem or whether we're talking about the Celtic Christians during the 400s, 500s, 600s in Ireland and, and in Britain at that time, who understood the need to follow the example of Christ. This was, this was something that was foundational. I want to tell a story here, bring up something that's recent in the news. This week, of course, Monday was June 30th, but on June 30th, a man named Leo Melamed, who's 82, he's a Jewish American lawyer and happens to be the head of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Anyways, he made a journey back to Japan. He wanted to honor a man named Shiyune Sugihara. Sugihara. Shiyune Sugihara. Because this man, for a period of some 74, at this time, almost exactly 74 years ago, starting this July, late July into August, Sugihara, for about a period of month, issued visas that allowed some 6,000 Jews to escape war-torn Lithuania and the, the oncoming Nazis. He saved several times as many people as the more well-known Oskar Schindler, you know, who is made famous by Spielberg's film Schindler's List. Th this Japanese diplomat, Sugihara, saves, you know, it sounds, it sounds like four to, you know, close five, five times. They're really debated a little bit. 6,000, maybe 10,000, some people say, saving Polish Jews and, and German Jews, uh, excuse me, uh, Lithuanian Jews from extermination camps. What, had, you know, what was coming to pass in 1940 in Eastern Europe, there were, in this opening phase of the World War II, the Second World War, there was a tremendous movement of people who were fleeing from the Nazis. The world was in turmoil. It was dangerous for these Jewish refugees who were fleeing to travel and it, <laughs> without a travel visa, some sort of visa to go to. And yet, at that point in time, at a point when it was so critical and so dangerous, most countries just looked the other way. They wouldn't let people in. You know, to our shame, you know, Canada and the United States, we really didn't do what we should have. <laughs> you know, these, we didn't. You look at the back at the historical record, it was, it's kind of sad. Leo Malamed noted, they were truly at that point in time at death's door. What was coming was the fire that was going to annihilate all of us. And then, all of a sudden, unexpectedly, this man Sugihara made the decision that he did. And it's fortunate because, of course, what was coming was that the Nazis were going to kill and Dil did kill most of the Jews there in Lithuania within one year. They were all dead and gone. At the time in 1940, the Japanese government required that visas be issued only through those who had gone through inappropriate immigration procedures and had enough funds. And most of these refugees didn't meet those criteria. They couldn't fit the letter of the rules of the policies. Sugihara dutifully contacted the Japanese foreign ministry three times for instructions. And each time, the ministry responded that Anybody granted a visa should have a visa to a third destination to exit Japan already, with no exceptions. Catch-22 in those days. Imp practically impossible to obtain. From July 18th to August 28th in 1940, Sugihara, aware that all the applicants were in danger, mortal danger, if they stayed behind, he began to grant them visas on his own initiative, taking his seals from the Japanese Imperial Empire and writing out visas. He would issue, he ignored the requirements, and he gave these refugees 
10-day visas to transit through Japan in violation of his orders. This was a very unusual act of disobedience given the culture of the Japanese Foreign Service. Very unusual. And it went farther, it went beyond that. Sugihara spoke to Soviet officials. Because if you remember in those days, you know, the, the Soviets had come west and the, not, while the Nazis were going east and, you know, you know, and they sort of split up everything. <laughs> but Sugihara had approached Soviet officials who agreed to let these Jewish refugees he would give a transit visa to, to travel through their country on these Trans-Siberian Railway, although they had to pay five times the normal ticket price. <laughs> <laughs> the Soviets were going to make this some good money on this. For 40 days, Sugihara hand-wrote visas, re reportedly spending some 18 to 20 hours a day doing this, producing a normal month's work of visas every single day until the 4th of September when he had to leave his post because his consulate was being closed. By the time... He had granted thousands of visas to Jews, many of whom were heads of household. These visas allowed them to take their entire families with them. It wasn't just a visa for one person. It was to a head of household, and the head of household was entitled to take their family. He, he began, and he recruited his wife, who <laughs> spent these long hours, as they said, 18 to 20 hours a day. And even when he was having to leave to take up his next post, he was still riding visas in the car. He, they put him on the train. He was still riding visas. He would even, then it, as the time got closer, he just took pieces of paper and was stamping them with, this, with his official seal and signing them and throwing the pages out the windows for the people to, to save their lives. And when he realized, when the train was finally starting to pull out, he stood up and bowed to the people and asked them to forgive him that he could not write any more. Turns out Sugihara, one of the other things he did is he threw his official government seals of that particular consulate, which he should have destroyed, he gave them to... Um, he gave them to some other people who, uh, even after his departure, kept surreptitiously <laughs> stamping paper and counterfeiting his signature. <laughs> so he did a bit of a, a dirty trick on that, even going beyond, you know, whatever gray point he had. So Gargo wondered in himself about what the official reaction would be to the thousands of visas that he issued. He had thought about that. He'd asked his family, actually, before he started doing this because he realized there might be consequences. Many years later, he crawled. No one ever said anything about it. <laughs> he, and he, well, he thought, well, probably they didn't realize how many visas I'd done <laughs> because in all the confusion of war. But after, when he left Lithuania, he took up his next post in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe as the Consul General in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and then in Konigsberg in East Prussia, and then in Bucharest, Romania, till the end of the war when the Soviets came in, captured him and put him and his family in a prisoner of war camp for 18 months. When they were released, they returned to, to, uh, returned to Japan in 1946. But in 1947, the Japanese Foreign Office asked Sugihara to resign. They said, well, we're having to downsize. But according to his wife, Yukiko Sugihara, they said that actually they were doing it as they, verbally because of that incident in Lithuania. It's hard to change careers. And in something like that, you know, Sugihara w w knew he was risking his career. He knew, actually, that he was also risking his life and the wife of his family, the life of his family, in doing this. And he eventually did die in obscurity in 1986, 
and for many years afterwards he was having to you know having to do all sorts of things to try to support his family even to the point of he was selling light bulbs door to door he ended up because he spoke Russian as well some he living for years separated from his family sometimes working in the old Soviet Union but why did he do this why did he put his career and risk the, his lives and, and, and have all these things happen to him afterwards? Because he could have had a comfy life, been a part of the privileged elite. He said he did it because if I follow the dictates of my government, I will violate the dictates of my God. Sugihara had become acquainted with Christianity when he was a university student. And he has his conscience, he had a conscience that had developed. In some one of his first postings, he'd been posted to the puppet government of the Japanese government was running to Manchuria in the 1930s. And he resigned, he, he was deputy, uh, I think he was deputy minister of this puppet government, and he resigned because he couldn't stand the way that they were, t how they were treating the local Chinese people. He couldn't do it. And it was all the question, you know, when you look at this, Leo Melamed, the man that he saved, who, who later, you know, he transited, his family did make the run through the Trans-Siberian Railroad and did end up in Japan. And then in April of 1941, we're able to catch a boat, you know, one of the last boats out of uh, Japan to, you know, to the United States, where he ended up in Chicago and head of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange eventually. But he said that Sugihara is the epitome of the issue of people asking, what can one man do by himself? Is it possible to do anything? And, and Melamed said, the answer is, of course, Sugihara shows that the answer is yes. You can make a difference. One person can make a difference. In 85, 1985, one year before his death, Israel honored Chiuni Sugihara as a righteous among the nations. He was too ill to travel to Israel at that point in time. His wife and some of his children did go and accept the honor on his behalf. And they were given perpetual Israeli citizenship by a grateful government for what he had done. The Simon Weisenthal Center uh, estimates that Sugihara they think he gave a minimum of at least 6,000 visas, uh, saved 6,000 particular Jews, these visas. He gave out more visas than that, but not everybody got to use them. Some people didn't take the visas and run with their lives immediately or couldn't get some things going and the Nazis caught them and killed them, which is a lesson in point. When you're given an open tour, you need to take it and run. But they said that now, because of Sugihara's what he did, the descendants of those people, there are now around 40,000 people, are alive because of this Japanese diplomat who disobeyed his government because he figured he had to obey God first. He had to obey God first. Shortly before his death, he was asked why he did it. He said, do you want to know about my motivation, don't you, Sugihara said. Well, it is the kind of sentiments anyone would have when he actually sees refugees face to face, begging with tears in their eyes. He just cannot help but sympathize with them. Among the refugees were the elderly and women. They were so desperate that they went so far as to kiss my shoes. Yes, I actually witnessed such scenes with my own eyes. Also, I felt at that time that the Japanese government did not have any uniform opinion in Tokyo. Some Japanese military leaders were just scared because of the pressure from the Nazis, while other officials in the home ministry were simply ambivalent. So I made up my mind not to wait for a reply. I knew that somebody would surely complain about me in the future, but I myself thought that this would be the right thing to do. There is nothing wrong in saving many people's lives. The spirit of humanity, neighborly friendship. With this spirit, I ventured to do what I did, confronting this most difficult situation. And because of this reason, 
I went ahead with redoubled courage. So can one person make a difference? The Bible and thinks says so. It, it really does think that. What difference did Joseph make in, in ancient Egypt when there he was taken as a slave? Could he make a difference? He held true, truly to God in his ways. God used him to stand in the gap to save the life of his family. And even the brothers that sold him into slavery to begin with, as well as the nation, so many of the poor people, your average person in Egypt, and how many other nations that went down to Egypt to buy food, just like Joseph's brothers had, had been doing. What difference did Moses make when he accepted the call that God gave him? Even though he said, you know, I can't speak, I can't do this, I can't, whatever. He eventually did it anyways. What difference did Gideon make? You know, he was, you know, who am I among my family? And who's my family in Israel? And they were occupied by a foreign power. But what difference could Gideon make? Well, he could. He could lead to a liberation of his people and a revival. The true worship of God, the, the God, the creator God, the God of the Bible. How about Esther? What could one person do? Well, Esther stood in the gap. And she reversed the destiny that the enemies of her people, you know, the, the Nazis of antiquity were going to try to do to completely wipe out all the Jewish people in the Persian Empire, which at that time would have included the, you know, almost all of the Jews, which would have frustrated from that standpoint. How would you have a Messiah? How could you have a Messiah if the people he was prophesied to come from were all exterminated? Can one person make a difference? Let's go to Isaiah. Let's turn to the book of Isaiah. I want to read this one, the expanded Bible, Bible version, new Bible version by Thomas Nelson Publishers. That's Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. This is Isaiah's calling. In the year that King Uzziah died, which according to the chronographers, it's about 740 B.C., I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne. His long robe filled the temple. Heavenly creatures of fire, that is the seraphim, you know, the word in Hebrew means the burning ones, and, you know, the, the seraphim, these creatures of power and purity and judgment, the heavenly creatures of fire attended him, just like this, you know, you see right later on in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6, you see the same sort of image of the heavenly creatures of fire, the seraphim attending God. Each creature had six wings. It used two wings to cover its face, shield from God's awesome glory. Two wings to cover its feet or its body, showing humility. Two wings for flying, get the job done. Each creature, verse 3, was calling to the others, Holy, 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 the Lord all-powerful. His glory fills the earth. Their calling caused the frame around the door to shake as the temple filled with smoke. And I said, I will be destroyed. I'm doomed. I'm ruined. I'm not pure. Many of the translations say a man of unclean lips, but he was saying I'm not pure or spiritually worthy. And I live among people who are not pure. But I have seen the King, the Lord, the All-Powerful, the Almighty. One of the heavenly creatures flew to me with a hot coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the creature touched my mouth with the hot coal and said, Look, your guilt is taken away because this hot coal has touched your lips. Something from before the altar of God. And your sin is taken away or it's atoned for. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, who can I send? Who will go for us? And I wonder if Isaiah was thinking, and he found himself hearing somebody else speak almost. So I said, here am I, send me. Isaiah is calling. God was looking for someone to do, well, to write in this particular case, the book of Isaiah, and to do the things that he did in Isaiah. And you think of all the things that occurred in Isaiah and how he worked with that entire nation. 
and how what he wrote still inspires us to this day. And Isaiah was one of the favorite prof, uh, prophets that Jesus liked to quote. How important was his ministry, his mission? His calling was important. Can one person make a difference? Did Isaiah's life make a difference? And it was a long time that he lived. Let's see another one. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel ch st chapter 3. Yes, God seems to think that one person can make a difference. 1 Samuel chapter 3, I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. And 1 Samuel 3 and verse 1. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli, who was the high priest. Now, in those days, it says, the messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. You know, oftentimes we think, oh, old covenant times, you know, things were happening all the time. Well, no. There were long stretches of time where, as it says, the messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, verse 2, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Remember, these were oil lamps, and they had to be attended to on, on occasion, probably daily at least. And Samuel was, was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God, and suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? And he got up and ran to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. The Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not know the Lord yet because he had never had a messages from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli, Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized the Lord, it was the Lord who was calling the boy. See, he perceived, and of course, God proceeds to tell a message to Samuel to give to Eli. And he was going to make a change in those who were, if, if you would, running the church at the time because there was corruption. And it was causing all sorts of problems. And it was displeasing greatly to God. God used Samuel greatly to do what? To do a lot of things. To be, he, he acted in a capacity of being a judge, of leading Israel for many years, helping to preserve them from being destroyed by the Philistines. Starting, you know, responding to this whole desire for a king. First with Saul, and then, of course, David. One person, could they make a difference? God thought so, and he called Samuel. Let's go to Romans 11. You know, Paul appreciated this aspect. Can a person... One person make a difference. I think Apostle Paul would certainly say, yes, people make a difference. In Romans chapter 11, verse 29, I'll read this one in the Amplified Version. <clears throat> For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. See, what God gives, he doesn't just decide, well, today, oh, this is what I'm going to do, and tomorrow, no. You know, it's not how it works. See, he has a job for you. He, when he calls you and he provides with gifts, he doesn't wake up in the following day, as it were, <laughs> and say, no, I don't want to do this. This is, you know, this is not how it works. He never withdraws them once they were given. He does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Let's go to uh, a little earlier here in Romans. Let's go to verse 28 in Romans 8. Romans 8, 28. Here's um, the Holman, Holman Christian Standard Bible. Romans 8, 28. 
We know this one. We know that all things work together, or in all things God works for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. When God calls, he has a purpose. And in that purpose, he will work for the good through whatever it might be going on. There's something that, you know, God has a plan. He has a future. And with all those he calls, he, he has this in mind. It's, it's not, you know, he doesn't change his mind. He continues. He doesn't just drop people, you know, and, and kick, you know, and just say, well, you're no longer important. You're no longer, I don't, no, that's not how it works. Because he thinks people can make a difference. Every single one of us, to one degree or another. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. I want to read this here in the, in, in the Coulter Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll start here in verse 26. God says this to you, and he says this to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that there are not many who are wise according to the flesh. Yeah, most of us don't have degrees from Harvard or the London School of Economics or whatever it might be, the Sorbonne or something like this. Not many who are wise according to the flesh. We don't have all the degrees famous from famous places. Not many who are powerful. Not many who are high-born among you. Yeah, as far as I know, we don't have any of the royal family attending with us. <laughs> Rather, God has chosen the foolish things of the world so that he might put to shame those who are wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world so that he might put to shame the strong things. And the lowborn of the world and the despised has God chosen, even the things that are counted as nothing in order that he might bring to nothing the things they are, so that no flesh might glory in his presence. When we're called to be the servants of God, it's not for, for our ego, <laughs> inflation of ego. No, God calls his people to make a difference in serving him because he, has, he does have a job to do. And he, he knows this world that we live in. He has a way that he likes to work. Let's go to Matthew here. Let's take a look here, a little bit of what Jesus had to say. Did Jesus think that, that we can make a difference? Even one person that we can make a difference? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to start here in verse 13. Matthew 5 and verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt become tasteless, with what shall it be salted? For it is no longer has any strength, but it is to be thrown out and to be trampled upon by men. So the salt has to continue to have that flavor. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a mountain cannot be hid. Neither do they light a lamp and put it under a bush, uh, bushel basket, but on a lampstand, for it shines for all that are in the house in the same way, also, you are to let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Then he goes on to make this point, of course. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish but fulfill. And he goes on to say, heaven and earth will pass away, but you know everything in that I've written is going to be fulfilled. But you see, the context of this the law and the prophets and all these things of, of God's will is that we're to be salt. We are to be light in testifying to these things, to be showing it. Salt tastes as you have this interaction, as it were. You know, in, in the, it, light is seen. 
verse 20, he concludes this whole, whole part. He says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness shall exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, there is no way you shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, the scribes and Pharisees did follow all, you know, they would tend to follow the rules and regulations, but they missed the overall point of what was important. Sugihara could have followed all the little, you know, regulations of his government and how they were going to issue visas, but he realized that if he did that, all these people would die. And for him, he couldn't obey the government and he, he, if it meant disobeying God. And so he was willing to put at risk everything. He didn't know how, well, how much it was going to cost him. He had no idea. And yet this was something he was going to have to do. We are the salt of the world. We are the light of the world. And it's not to be hidden. Salt is meant to be tasted. So we can't hide what God asks us to be, what God asks us to do. And in many ways, this light that we shed in the world, you know, we, you know, we're not all called at this point in time. You know, we, we don't have necessarily, you know, we're not in positions like Sugihara where we're a council someplace and we have the power to do this, that, and the other. No, we're not that way. And yet God asks us when he calls us, sometimes in it's very, it seems like, inconsequential ways to make a difference in others' lives around us. Let's go. I want you to see this. But God notices, you see. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm going to go to verse 36 here. Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. Sometimes we think, oh, what difference can I make? <laughs> That's not the way God looks at it. Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. The Acts of the Apostles. Now there was in Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which being interpreted is called Dorcas. And she was full of good works and of alms that she did. And it came to pass in those days that she became sick and died. And after washing her, they put her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, when the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, beseeching him not to, lay, not to delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he arrived, they brought him into the upper room. And all the widows stood around him, weeping and showing him the tunics and garments with which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Clothing was a big deal in the ancient world. It wasn't as easy to obtain now where we have, you know, you can get cheaply made Chinese clothes and things like this. It's not, it wasn't like that. <laughs> clothing was expensive. It took a long time to make because you had to weave the, the clothing by hand. You had to assemble it and, and sew it. It took a lot of time. It was an essential thing. I mean, you, you couldn't walk around naked. <laughs> So all these people were there showing the things that Dorcas had made for them. But after putting everyone out, people, Peter fell to his knees and prayed. Then turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. In Hebrew, it would have been Tabitha Kumi. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and helped her stand up. And after calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And this became known throughout the whole city of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. For her good example, which he did, God set up a miracle that brought many more into the household of faith. It was a good thing that she did. It was a good thing that Peter did. Peter, this one who at one point had denied Christ, came back and no longer denied, but had faith and proved to be the leader among the people that was needed. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. 
I'll read this just in the Amplified. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, that we may do those good works which God predestined, that's planned beforehand for us. Taking the paths which he prepared ahead of time, is the way the Amplified expands it, that we may do those good, good works that God predestined for us, that we should walk in them. Living the life, doing those things, making the difference with what he gives us. It's, it's a remarkable thing. God gives us these opportunities. We have to remember, and we should remember, this is a powerful example that Shiuni Sugihara set for us. And God gives us a word of exhortation, and it's, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Sugihara knew this, but let's, let's just go to that. Let's just turn to Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. See, he recognized, he saw what was going to happen, and he knew that there was a risk, but he said he saw what needed to be done, and he strengthened himself and did what needed to be done at the time. Proverbs chapter 24, 24 and verse 10. It says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those being drawn to death and hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know it, does not he who searches the heart consider it? And the keeper of your soul, does he not know it? And does he not repay to every man according to his works? I wonder if Sugihara knew that scripture. It's possible he did. It's possible he did. He certainly followed it. Can one man make a difference? His actions, by what he did, there are 40,000 people alive today. And they've contributed. Many of these people, you look at who these people are, and you know, in all levels of society, they're contributing and helping more. The example of good that he set and taking, taking the risks that he did has borne incredible fruit over the years. Well, what does God, anyways, want us to be? Let's go, let's close with this scripture. Let's think about this in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. I'm going to read this one in the um, expanded Bible version. Philippians 2 and 12. My dear friends, or beloved, you have always obeyed God when I was with you, Apostle Paul is writing. It is even more important that you obey now that I am away from you. You know, it's, it's as if these words were written for us. Paul, you know, the apostles are not with us at this point in time, but it's even more important, he says, to obey now that they're not with us. It says, keep on working to complete your salvation with fear. Other versions will say, it, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The word fear here, working out your salvation or completing your salvation is, is with awe and reverence. That's what the word fear is. This, this, you know, it's not the negative connotation of fear. What we're doing well, it is God's plan, God working us. He's predestined us to accomplish some of these things, that he gives us opportunities. He brings us, up, he brings us into contact with people and situations that we can add salt to the discourse of this world, that we can shine a light that people can see and have hope. Yes, it is this point. As Peter, is, as Paul is saying here, Beloved, 
as you've always obeyed God when I was with you, do it now when I'm not. Keep on working to complete your salvation with that fear and reverence and trembling because God is working in you to help you want to do and be able to do what pleases him. Yet God works in us to be able to do his pleasure. This is not always easy. Sometimes it's really hard. It can be difficult. So he works at us to help us want to do and to be able to do, to give us the opportunities. He had to be, you know, God had to stick Sugihara at this place in Lithuania. He was there at the right time to save all those people's lives. To be able to do what pleases him. Verse 14 Philippians 2, 14, do everything without complaining or arguing. Okay, that, <laughs> that's always good for us. No grumbling, which comes naturally and easily to us. Verse 15, then you will be innocent and without any wrong. God's children without fault. But you are living with people that are crooked and evil among whom, however, you will shine like stars in a dark world. When I read that scripture here in Philippians 2, 15, I think of, can't help but think of Daniel. Because Daniel had something, you know, the prophecy that God's people would shine like stars forever and ever, those that are wise. Yes, but you are living with people that are, that are crooked and evil, among whom, however, you are to shine like stars in a dark world. We're to be that salt, we're to be that light to accomplish this will of God that he's predestined, that he is going to empower us to do. Let's consider these things. What difference can one person make? What difference can you make? Well, allow God to work in you. Allow God to empower you, and it will make a difference to those around you. We never know. It could be, you know, subtle, on a small scale, like Tabitha or Dorcas. Or it could be massive scale, somebody like Moses. It's God who will give you, who will prepare you and empower you to do those things. Allow him to do his work, because one person can make a difference. You can make a difference.